This is Dan Schneider on this Dan Schneider video interview. The subject is Joseph Campbell. The show is called Contra Campbell or Contra Campbell, and it's about whether or not the monomyth and the hero's journey is a good thing in literature and art today. Joseph Campbell is the subject. His ideas about the monomyth and the hero's journey and assorted other things uh, is under scrutiny. I have four people who have some opinions about it, and we will be talking with them in a moment. On the left side of the screen, we have Gabriel Hart and Gina Jorgensen, and on the right side, we have Joel Christensen and Valerie Frankel. Uh, I will give each of them a few minutes to give a little bit of background about who they are and their opening opinions about Campbell, and then we will mix it up a little bit. So uh, let me start with you on the top left. Gabriel, can you give a little bit of background about who you are and your opening volleys about Campbell, etc.? Sure thing, yeah. My name's Gabriel Hart. I live in uh, Joshua Tree, uh, California High Desert. Um, I'm an author, journalist, uh, do poetry, kind of do it, do it all. Um, I write for Lit Reactor, as well as the Los Angeles Review of Books. Um, so, yeah, to kind of seg segue into Hero's Journey type stuff while we're here, I I review books like crazy. I, you know, I'm just going I'm going through tons of books, and I um, I feel I felt like I started to get um, hero's journey fatigue after reading all these books. I, I wondered why I always kind of came felt empty after after reading all these books. I almost felt like I was reading the same story over and over again. And I and to be to um, just to be clear, I love Joseph Campbell. I think. The Power of Myth is, yeah, one of the greatest things ever written. I think it's he put words into feelings that no one could have. But um, it's more of just like a personal taste. I feel like I've I've developed, uh, yeah, hero's journey fatigue. And I so as an experiment, I wrote this article, this essay for Lit Reactor um, earlier this year, and I, it just got it really resonated with people. I was I thought I was going to have a lot of. Uh, backlash, but it, it seemed to really resonate with people. So I guess that's why I'm here. <laughs> yes, I, that was the article I found. Uh, on the bottom left, Gina Jorgensen. I interviewed her a couple of shows ago, a few weeks ago on a different topic. So she's back again. So Gina, those who have not uh, seen that show or who don't know about you, could give a little background about yourself and your opening volleys about Joseph Campbell. Yes, so I am a folklorist by training, and um, I teach at the college level. I also write blog posts, fiction, nonfiction, poetry, all the things. And I have kind of grown accustomed to people saying, you're a folklorist, you must love Joseph Campbell. And it's like, mm, <laughs> not not really, actually. So um, I wrote a blog post about, about why folklorists generally loathe um, Campbell's hero's journey. And that has gotten a fair bit of attention, some positive, some negative. Um, but I'm really interested in narrative structure, and I'm really interested in gender and sexuality and where all these things sort of uh, intersect. So um, I'm glad that Campbell has gotten people interested in folklore. You know, you can go to the folklore and mythology section of Barnes & Noble. There's a whole shelf just for Campbell. Um, people love it, apparently, and eat it up. And if it leads them to other folklore and mythology topics and authors that I think are more accurate perhaps, um, I think that's fine, but I get annoyed when people think that the entirety of my scholarly discipline with its centuries long history is like just Campbell. And I'm like, mm, no. Well, I'll go and counterclockwise then. I'll go to Valerie Frankel on the bottom right. Uh, Valerie, if you could give your opening shots about Campbell and who you are. Hi, I am Valerie Estelle Frankel, the author of um, from Girl to Goddess on how the heroine's journey works in mythology. And I have just written The Villain's Journey. There's actually a lot of books on the heroine's journey. I've done over 10, and I know other scholars have done it. But I'm the first to do The Villain's Journey. And I enjoy Joseph Campbell. I came up with his theories on my own, but I had an advantage over him as I had watched Star Wars and things like that 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 weren't available to him that made this all very obvious and so yes i've enjoyed joseph campbell and another thing i noticed about is in the intro to his final book he wrote i saw a heroine's journey happening in mythology same as the hero's journey but i didn't write about it somebody else will have to do it 
So he saw some of the holes and some of the things he hadn't explored, even as, as he was aware, his pattern was used to make some very popular things like Star Wars. And I would agree that in the book industry and, oh my God, the movie industry, we have definitely overuse the tropes. Yeah. Let me just ask you something, Riley, since you talk about the villain's journey. Um, uh, one of the, the villains that I can't stand, and I, I really don't like the performance of it, has nothing to do with Campbell. Do you deal with the Joker and Heath Ledger? Because I think that's one of the most god-awful overrated performances in film history. <laughs> Yes, but I wasn't particularly there to critique the performance, uh, okay. good or bad. I was looking more at the tropes and the script and what they were trying to say. So the bits that leapt out at me in that story were the bits where he's challenging Batman on a personal psychological level saying you could so easily be me. I want to show you that you and everybody else are so similar to me and are as immoral as I am. And that's the psychological challenge I'm offering. Okay. His performance, different category. Okay. Uh, Joel uh, Christensen rounds out our quartet. Joel, if you could give a little background about yourself and your opening thoughts about Joseph Campbell. Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me, uh, Dan. Um, I am a professor at Brandeis University. Uh, my training is in Homeric studies, um, and I've written on the Iliad and the Odyssey almost exclusively for about 20 years. Um, and I got an, interested in Campbell over time because I've been teaching myth for almost as long. So I'm teaching myth at uh, New York University, at University of Texas, San Antonio, and here at Brandeis. Um, I've had to deal with Campbell because I teach heroic myth. Um, and over time, I've gotten steadily more frustrated um, with Campbell as a model for what uh, he offers students in studying myth, um, but also in what Campbell's done to our own storytelling traditions. Um, so one of my largest problems with, with Campbell's work and a lot of the archetypal work that um, he comes out of is that it's descriptive, but people treat it as prescriptive. It's a reductive approach to myth. Um, and it needs significant updating thanks to what we know these days about cognitive psychology um, and sort of the science behind narrative and storytelling. So my approach in recent years, I sort of retrained and spent about seven to eight years learning about cognitive science, um, and I wrote a book about psychology and the Odyssey. Along the way, I teamed up with Sarah Bond, and I wrote um, a thing for the LA Review of book, Books on Campbell, which is sort of a volley. Um, that it brings out uh, some of the problems of the sort of prescriptive uh, approach to myth. Um, and that's that Campbell doesn't leave much room or the model myth doesn't leave much room for 95% of life, hmm. right? Even if you use it as a model for sort of like as being a child of the family drama, um, it has significant gender problems. The heteronormativity makes me want to cry. Um, and it leaves little room for sort of aging, for growing, for doing all the things we have to do. So for me, from a perspective of discourse, the way story works in the world and shapes us and remakes us, um, the monomyth is horribly insufficient and actually does active harm. Yeah. So because everybody else is being nice, I'm going to take it a, a little further. Um, and the model I think of is that it, it demonstrates what I think of as toxic heroism. Um, and this isn't Campbell's fault. It's at the beginning of the Iliad and the Odyssey where everybody thinks that Odysseus and Achilles are heroes, but they both kill all their people. Um, and what I try to introduce back into the system of storytelling is it's fine to see the patterns, but critical narrative traditions understand that the monomyth is a problem and reflect on it, that heroes actually destroy their people. And what we need isn't more heroic narratives, but more narratives that teach us how to become part of communities. So uh, I want to just, uh, before we get off deep into it, I want to touch a little bit about who Campbell was and why his idea became well known. But I want to uh, start by talking just briefly about why I wanted to do this show. Now, uh, I first heard of Campbell uh, in the mid to late 80s with the cloyingly ask kissy Bill Moyers specials with him, which I thought were horrendous even then as a young man. But the reason I wanted to do this show was there's a, YouTube channel called Polyphonic out there. And 
it's a typical young fellow who does some pretty good uh, reviews of music, and he took on Led Zeppelin's Stairway to Heaven and tried to cast it as part of the monomyth. And I just uh, had one of these, like, you know, what is a V8 moments where I just slapped my head and like, what the fuck is this abomination? Because <laughs> Led Zeppelin <laughs> and the Stairway to Heaven has absolutely nothing to do with the monomyth. Uh, it has to do with Christian symbolism and a number of other things. But it, to me, it was just so distant. And this kid was so earnest in his arguments that I, I, I said, I've got to do some kind of show that just shows how ridiculous th this has been stretched as an idea. So with that in mind, uh, do, do any of one of you want to start off just giving a little bit of background about who Campbell was and why in the late 40s his idea rooted itself? I, I don't know, Joel or Gina, do you want to take that uh? Either one, Joel. You want to go since you seem to want to play the villain here. <laughs> uh, I mean, I actually don't know that much about the man. Um, okay. I know some process afterwards, and I actually part of that's intentional. I mean, part of my practice as a narrative person is I try to separate stories and patterns from artists and people who create them. Um, so, you know, uh, some of the intellectual background is he's heavily influenced um, by a psychoanalytic approach to uh, myth. Um, and before him, I think part of what the problem with talking about Campbell as a person and his biography is that we separate him out from the intellectual traditions that made his work possible, right? Um, as early, you know, two centuries earlier um, with, with Prop and then followed up by others, we have people who are laying out the patterns that you're talking about. So, I mean, example from Stairway to Heaven that you're mentioning, like Christian eschatology and narrative is deeply um, shaped by the same paradigmatic traditions that Campbell sees elsewhere, that, that Vladimir Propp saw elsewhere, um, and that people like Freud and Jung identified. So I really think to start talking about um, Campbell is to go back to Freud and Jung and archetypes and the whole family drama, right? The idea that myth and narrative are part of a collective unconscious. And so for me, Campbell is a, is a popularizer of this, uh, of, yeah. of this school. Yeah, just to kind of follow up on that. So I, I don't have all these dates memorized, but I'm currently reading Maria Tatar's excellent The Hero with a Thousand and One Faces, and she just has a lovely little chapter about this. So yeah, I completely agree. Um, Campbell was building on previous work, um, such as the uh, 1909 Otto Rank um, volume, The Myth of the Birth of the Hero, which is very much in a Freudian psychoanalytic tradition. Um, 1936, Lord Ragland's The Hero, a study in tradition, myth, and drama. So those both are, were very early models based very much on like the, the Greek and classical heroes. Um, Vladimir Prop, Russian uh, formalist folklorist, is writing in uh, 1928, translated English not until like a few decades later. Um, but I really do distinguish between the influences of Freud and Jung on Campbell. Um, I see Campbell as very Jungian, um, which I take issue with because I also don't like Jung. I, I was raised by Freudians in, in the woods, basically, um, as in my intellectual history. Um, my folklore mentor at UC Berkeley, Alan Dundas, was a huge Freudian. And so while there are lots of aspects of Freud that I don't care for, at least Freud's ideas are culturally relativizable and can be tested, you know, whether how we treat infants shows up in our projective fantasies later. And I think you can test that. You can have a hypothesis. Whereas Jung just went straight for the universals. He went straight for the archetypes. And like Jung really lost me at one point. He was talking about how he was writing about how every culture has a Christ child archetype. And as a Jewish atheist, I'm like, no, no, thank you. Nope, just nope. So where I see Campbell really drawing on these traditions is um, going the union pathway of saying there are universals, we can access them, we can usefully talk about them, and I just completely disagree. Uh, Valerie, uh, do you have anything to say? Or? Um, I thought I'd give a more pop culture approach to who are these people and what are they doing, although it's quite likely that anybody uh, listening to this already knows enough about the topic to be interested in it. But anyway, um, from a literary point of view, um, Jung was saying, also works in dreams, that you could look at characters as part of the main person's personality. If you're dreaming of, about a wise little helper in the woods, this is your, your inner voice giving you advice. And one of the most blatant places to look for this is, for instance, Wizard of Oz, the people traveling with her are her brains, her heart, and her courage giving her advice. 
So you read any literature at all, really, from that kind of perspective. And Joseph Campbell, as we said, built on all these prior traditions and also folklorist and fairy tale work and said, yeah, I'm seeing the same story pattern in every hero myth from every culture. And this is the hero is raised by adoptive parents who don't understand him. And yeah, it's usually a him, although sometimes there's a her in Joseph Campbell's hero's journey. And then the bearded wizard comes to the door and says, good news, I am Obi-Wan slash Gandalf slash Merlin slash Dumbledore, and you are the son of a king, or you have the magic power, you are, as everybody's been saying lately, the chosen one. Take your father's sword and let's go off on an epic quest. Off they go through a bunch of other steps that are pretty repeated throughout these things. And then they find that the hero finds himself in the deepest, scariest, place of all representing the underworld and also like the inner self and there he's battling somebody who represents everything he's rejected in his life everything he's chosen not to be which is called the shadow in Jungian terms and this is every choice Harry made to make him not a Voldemort and then there he is facing Voldemort, which is like facing the choices he rejected. And this is all a big fat metaphor from growing to child, from child to adult. So we see this a lot as an adolescent story. That was very simplified, but just an idea of what we are agreeing and disagreeing with. Yeah. Gabriel, your thoughts? Um, so I read, I read The Power of Myth maybe, I was kind of a late bloomer with it actually. I read it maybe four years ago. And I remember, I remember being kind of touched by it, like kind of connecting the dots and that was kind of reassuring, you know, relating story, you know, traditional stories I was familiar with. But at the same time, time, I immediately, when I finished it, I, I felt sort of like if, if it is a universal um, blueprint, it seems like we're trapped in it in a way. Like Joel was saying, I feel like it does have this tendency to have created this sort of toxicity in culture where people, um, where we think our lives are a story. And I think that that's a dangerous, I think that that's kind of a dangerous um, thing to get, um, mindset to get stuck in. And I think that speaks for, um, you know, the entitlement of our cultures, our, you know, thinking that we're owed something, thinking that, um, or taking for granted introspection thinking you're owed something for introspection or owed owed something for a good deed do you know what i mean it's so it seems like it's an unsustainable it seems like it's it gives i think when you read a story that follows a hero's journey you get that dopamine rush at the end because it's very tidy and kind of wrapped up at the end you know it's almost like a freeze frame and laughing kind of thing but it's I don't know. Personally, it leaves me feeling empty. It leaves me feeling I'm like I'm not able to relate to it as a as a person. It's so that's that was my immediate. As impressed as I was with the power myth, I I felt trapped by it, and I and I started seeing it in all these books I had been reading, and just like I said before, it just felt like I was reading the same story over and over again, and just left me feeling very empty. And the the stories I gravitate towards are more like um where there's no stories where there's no heroes or villains i think i think our culture has an addiction to to it's almost like we can't do anything if, if it doesn't involve the villain i mean from our current kind of culture wars to to our own creative uh creative um endeavors so uh i want to talk about the two main ideas that are associated with Campbell, the two main terms uh we don't have time to get into all of the the, the details and whatnot, and I do have uh, I do have a, a what I thought was a, quite a, a nice uh, article that I want to just mention a little bit later on that summarizes some of the major points against uh, Campbell's ideas. But oftentimes the monomyth and the hero's journey are lumped together as sort of one thing. Um, Gina, are they one thing? And if not, what are what are, are ways that that they differ? Um, I usually do hear them used synonymously, at least in my field, um, so it might, it might be different for other scholars, but um, the monomyth is this idea that there is one structure to all 
mythic narrative, the mono myth, which is also kind of the hero's journey. Um, and the hero's journey has its steps, as Valerie has neatly um, summarized for us. Um, so yeah, it's just this idea. And, and again, like, you know, narrative structure is an interesting and complicated topic. Um, it depends on how far you want to break things down into their parts and what you consider part of the more superficial motif for trope level versus what's actually in the structure. And are we talking more like propian um, syntagmatic structuralism in terms of the order of the events that they have to happen in? Or are we talking more like Claude Lévi-Strauss, like paradigmatic structuralism? You're looking at opposing binaries underneath the superficial, the superficial parts of the narrative. So narrative structure gets very complicated. Um, and I think that's what we should keep in mind here, that like different storytelling traditions of different genres in different cultures do have different structures. And to sort of sweep them all under the rug as a monomyth, I think is incredibly reductive and ignorant. Uh, Valerie, do you have a comment? Well, it depends how you look. And yes, I've talked to folklorists before. Um, as an English major, I feel like one can make any case about any literature, including Stairway to Heaven, if you can back it up with evidence. So I will absolutely sit there and go, okay, I'm applying the hero's journey to whatever came out this week. Let's go. And again, I apply my analysis of symbolism and so on to all genres and franchises I've done the heroine's journey with mainstream lit when people ask me to stop doing fantasy, although it's most obviously seen in fantasy and mythology and epic. But yeah, as a literature major, I feel like I can apply any lens to any text and quite likely make a good or somewhat half-hearted case for it. <laughs> uh, Joel, comments about the monomyth and or the hero's journey being the same or different? Or um, so I think I agree that with Jenna that it, that it's mostly the same. The way I would nuance it, like if I were teaching a class, is that the monomyth is more about sort of the three act arc that has withdrawal and return as its sort of core um, engine, whereas the hero's journey is, is a subset of that that lays out all those specific points. Right. So if I were to make, you know, a little set subset argument, I'd say all um, heroes journeys are monomyths, um, but not every monomyth is necessarily a hero's journey. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I, I'm going to hedge that a lot, though, um, because I think, you know, the, the hero's journey gets those 13, 18, however many steps it is. Whereas the monomyth, if you look at pictures of it, is more of a, you know, the, the withdrawal and return cycle. So that's a, a basic understanding. So basically, the, the difference in your opinion is the monomyth is sort of looking at it through sort of a, a medium lens, a medium frame, whereas uh, the hero's journey is trying to get more in for the close-ups of the details of the story? Yeah, I think so. And there are also points, that, to give a basic example, I think you could use monomyth to analyze the traditional story of Demeter, as in the Homeric hymn to Demeter, where you have a process of, of exile, withdrawal, and return to new rites, um, but you definitely don't have a lot of the stuff you get with a hero's journey, like, you know, the call to whatever and the magic whatever. Sorry, I'm, I'm, relative, or I'm dismissing it because I find the specificity of some of the hero's journeys uh, models a little ridiculous. Um, and so I think part, that's partly why the recourse to the monument is a little more attractive, because I think, you know, one of the things that um, was already said is about is that narrative structures are so flexible, right? And the way, you know, I see, you know, let's say the monument is a core DNA, um, and then the, hero, the uh, hero's journey is sort of like that DNA in different, in different epigenetic circumstances, right? Really putting it through specific um, traces. If I could break in a sec, I absolutely have charted Demeter on the path, and yes, I could name every one of the steps, although I was doing heroine's journey, but it's pretty similar. However, I do agree with your definition. Um, I might throw an alternate example of um, the monomyth as um, descent and return, modern American weddings, um, right after the wedding, the couple disappears, possibly for photos, but they disappear. And then they're introduced at the reception as this big, okay, now they're Mr. and Mrs. Everybody gather around and cheer. 
And that's a simple version of the monomyth, which does uh, feature in initiation rituals, as again, they depart from the public and return with their new identities. And so, it, it, yeah, if I just want, I want to add to that, so one of my frustrations with sort of a Campbellian approach is, um, is, is a picking of details for a given myth, irrespective of the particular articulation of that myth, right? So if I look at Demeter Persephone myth, I want to go to a specific space and time and think about how audiences in that time look at a specific version that we may, that we may have. Um, and so that's one thing that, that really troubles me is it tends to be a cherry picking which details work to the panel. Um, a secondary thing on that is, as you know, I think um, that um, that uh, Valerie said very cleverly and well that the wedding ritual it does fall follow, follow that um, return uh, withdrawal and return pattern. Um, but when I get, I, I find the monomyth in those applications to be so generic that I don't really learn much from the recognition that it follows the same pattern. It's like pointing out that we all have bilateral symmetry. It's interesting, right? But what does it really do for me as someone who possesses that? Yeah. Well, it, it reminds me of the saying from Kurt Vonnegut when he sort of slagged on Campbell. He said, this is a guy who spent a career figuring out that heroes get into trouble and then get out of trouble, you know. Um, but uh, uh, Gabriel, uh, let me just ask uh, your opinion on this and then we'll uh, pause here for a moment. Um, I, I honestly don't have anything to add. I think the rest of you kind of nailed it. And I would I would kind of agree, especially with the way Joel, Joel and um, Valerie. So uh, let's get back to talking about uh, the idea that uh, Campbell had that this monomyth, this hero's journey, is somehow emblemic or, or representative of most stories. And I think that's pretty much wholly false, certainly when it comes to poetry. If you're talking epopee, you could make an argument of it. But even if you look back at lyric poetry, and I don't know how well versed uh, all of you people are in poetry, I look at sort of classical Chinese poetry, and even when they're talking about battles and myths, there's a very clear eye uh, that a modern take on things. Uh, and a lot of, I think a lot of what has been lumped under Campbellian uh, uh, monomyth actually in some ways subverts it or just is totally out side of it. And I, I can go back probably to the earliest of the myths, the Gilgamesh epic. And yes, there's there's some uh, gods there, there's some magic going on there. But in the end, uh, Gilgamesh, even though we're missing some of the ma major tablets, the Gilgamesh tale uh, is not really, doesn't fit the monomyth pattern. He ends up uh, uh, he, he's still pretty much, let's, he starts out as an asshole and he's not much better by the end of the, the myth there. Uh, uh, his friend dies uh, and he doesn't seem to learn much. But by the same token, I think that's one of the reasons Gilgamesh is a much more compelling character than a lot of the Greek characters uh, from classical literature. So uh, let me throw that out there. Uh, let me start with you, Gabe, uh, Gabriel. Uh, what what would you say about the idea that the, the monomyth really doesn't it only include it really is only good for talking about epopee or these epic ideas but the vast majority of human tales and and poetry etc just don't fit into it yeah i yeah i agree i feel like i feel like writing you're sort of in the business of dreams in a way you're selling you're selling your you're writing and selling dreams, and I think dreams just aren't aren't likely to to follow something that tidy. Um, it's, yeah, poetry too. It's yeah, I, I couldn't agree with that more. Um, let me go uh, to Valerie. Uh, what is your take on uh, the idea that uh, uh, Campbell is only maybe pretty good when it, you're talking with epopee and these heroic journeys, but they're not the, they're the overwhelming minority of human tales. I'm still seeing it as the majority. And yeah, I've read lots of stuff around the world. Poetry wasn't really the focus. Um, once again, I have charted out Gilgamesh and I do see the steps. Although yes, that English major perspective I mentioned, but I see him learning that you can't cheat death, which of course is a classic out of mythology. And I've used that one a lot to show the difference between the very 
linear um, focus on the world of life and not losing what you've got and staying at the pinnacle of the hierarchy for the male journey versus a more cyclical Demeter and Persephone, you die each year and return each year for the feminine journey. So I see Gilgamesh as absolutely archetypal is what it's trying to say again from an all these things work together perspective at the same time as somebody who wrote on the heroine's journey and the villain's journey is actually working a book on the trans hero's journey after somebody asked me you know are there any other options here um i do see that there are different different stages of life that they're exploring like i said a lot of the classic one is the adolescent well gilgamesh is not an adolescent and he's having the quest of i don't want to grow old and die which is more of a midlife crisis hero's journey so you get some different stuff going on and i've also seen um the 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 sage the older yeah the older person's hero's journey. So you do get some different life stages being explored. Joel, what is your take on the idea that the monomyth it only encompasses a minority of human tales? I think it's absolutely correct, but let me expand. Um, so, you know, I think that what the monomyth does is it reduces um, storytelling to very simple building blocks. Um, and if we're to take, you know, I want to talk both about epic and about lyric because this is kind of my wheelhouse. Um, but I think the difference between a monomyth and what we get with the Gilgamesh poems and the Alien and the Odyssey is that all three of these epic traditions are deeply critical of the stories that are set up, right? Um, so, you know, the Gilgamesh poems, and again, I can't, I'm calling them poems because they come from, you know, three millennia total, and we've sort of put them together in a whole narrative. Um, but the famous ending is, uh, is Gilgamesh looking back at, at his city and say, and reciting the beginning of the poem as a part of his fame. Right. Um, so it's, it, it betrays sort of a literary type of myth or mythologized literature that's deeply complex. And yeah. And uh, Joel, this, it, 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 it just struck me when you said that that's very much like uh, uh, Quixote. Uh, thousands of years before. Right. And, and there's a game there because actually when he uses the language to describe the walls of the city, it overlaps with the language used to describe the tablets in which the poem was written. Yeah. Right? So there's something deeply um, metapoetic about that poem as well as the Iliad and the Odyssey. Um, and so these poems, they are rich and complex and they have monomythic um, for, uh, contents within them. But what happens when you're looking for the monomyth is you're missing everything else. Right? and everything that gives a variety in life to it. And I, I also note that you may try to chart any one of these as having just a monomythic pattern, but within it, it's fractal. There are millions of different uh, mythic patterns within them. And by looking at only one part, we don't see the rest. And as far as sort of lyric goes, um, or other epics, there are lost traditions. And one of the, the, the problems I have with the monomyth is it reifies, it concretizes uh, 3,000 years of looking at only certain people's stories. So the stories of enslaved peoples, the stories of women, the stories of trans individuals are not actually reflected in the monomyth because we've selected for certain stories, mostly male, cis, het, white, over time. And the continued use of the monomyth in the 20th century just doubles down on that. Um, and so I think in its most sophisticated form, literary, literary myth or mythologized literature like the Hill and the Odyssey preset, presents an inset critique of mythical patterns and how they shape us. And the problem with monomyth is it scrubs storytelling of that critique and just gives us this sort of um, saleable good, right? This pattern that's like, it's like heroin for the mind, right? It's completely narcissistic and it makes you focus on that one thing we all want to, uh, which is ourselves. Mm. Uh, Gina, as, uh, well, what's your comment on this? And then I'll go to the next segment uh, with, uh, starting with you, what's your comment about uh, it being the minority of tales? Yes, um, here I think it's really important to pay attention to narrative genre as well as cultural context, because um, just w within the, the folklore scholarship world, we tend to think that there are a, a bunch of um, folk narrative genres. Um, 
three primarily that you'll see in every culture, uh, myth, legend, and folk tale or fairy tale, uh, myth being um, sacred narratives about the origins of the world, humanity, the first gods, first animals, whatever, whatever, told as though true by believers, often at the root of a religion. Um, and we don't use myth pejoratively like, oh, that's just a myth. Um, it can be true for its believers. Um, legend is a belief tale about something that could well have happened, but more in like recent or historical time rather than mythic time back when the gods walked the earth. And um, folktale is a fictional formulaic narrative. We see them in um, the Arabian Nights, the Decameron, um, Canterbury Tales, fairy tales, ballads, things of that nature. So um, most cultures have some way of sorting these things into true and less true stories, more um, important for the validation of why our culture is why it is, more just kind of entertaining life lessons, morals, uh, critique, parody, any number of functions can be attributed to these different narratives. So to say, hey, all narrative has the same structure and to ignore these genre distinctions is just wrong-headed in my opinion. Um, going back to the gender stuff too, you know, if every um, narrative has to have a you know, mythic, monomythic kind of structure, well, too bad for all the heroines of fairy tales who like, don't go anywhere. Where does Sleeping Beauty go? What's her quest? She yeah. falls asleep, you know? So um, I think that the monomyth is very, patriarchal it very much assumes that only men live interesting lives it assumes that women are there for the conquering or advice giving maybe both at once i don't know multitasking and so i just i have a lot of problems with this um well you sort of uh uh took what i was going to say to segue to you but i'll i'll, I'll do it anyway um uh you delineated the difference between myths legends folklore and stuff and it seems to me that that the monomyth generally deals with the uh, the more what you call mythic or legendary, and one of the one of the things, uh, the points that I always made with that the whole idea of the hero's journey and the monolith, putting aside all the things that you and Joel and the others have said, is that it tends to to, to focus on the bronze, the brawn of the characters versus the brain of the character, the ex uh, the exterior over the interior, the objective over the subjective uh, view of whatever's going on in the story. And also the physical over the emotional. Um, do you have any comment on any of those things I just mentioned, Gina? Yes, um, I think the hero's journey is very much focused on the external quest. And uh, to draw on something I remember reading in um, Gail Carriger's book, uh, her heroine's journey book, um, the hero's journey by definition ends up with him, you know, the the um, going out, the initiation, the return, all the things. Um, he usually ends up quite isolated. Like he he must bear the burden for all of society to be this heroic figure and defeat the monster and blah blah blah. Um, be, maybe be a culture hero of some sort, um, and thus he ends up isolated. Which again is sort of an interesting outcome for those of us wanting to like relate and sort of go along in a little like psychosomatic journey or something like that. Um, whereas the heroine's journey is more about connection. That is sent to the underworld is one where you are isolated against your will and you have to sort of make friends along the way and somewhere in around the dark night of the soul and blah blah blah. So I do I do think that the hero's journey tends to be very externally focused. It tends to be more isolating, more about solving problems with violence and things like that, um, which again just ignores a lot of the daily realities of a lot of people around the world. Uh, Valerie, do you have a comment on what Gina just said? Well, it's like saying all movies are action, no movies have any spiritual stuff to them. It depends which movie. All heroes journey, I would agree that heroine's journey is um, more likely about endurance and the internal life. Um, and hero's journey is more likely to glorify big battles or Theseus and King Arthur going out and whacking people with clubs. But that once again goes back to what was the storyteller's aim and, you know, who who is the audience here. I have seen plenty of Hero's Journey stories that are absolutely just about whacking people with clubs and glorifying violence, lone hero, all the things we could name and all the things that, yes, arguably we should be moving past in the 21st century. And yes, yeah, sexist and all those fingers as well. Um, and I've also seen Hero's Journey or Heroine's Journey stories that are very spiritual, very about self-sacrifice, the inner world, um, learning spirituality, giving up the violence. Harry Potter is a childish 
response to that. But Harry Potter is very much about the internal world and living with others, and very specifically about learning that um, using killing spells on people is not the way to solve the, everything. That's what Voldemort has been doing, and that's why he dies in the end. So it depends what you're reading. Okay, uh, let me turn to Gabriel. Um, let me just nuance that a little bit. Um, uh, do you see a difference between a hero slash heroine and an antagonist? Because uh, that would seem to, to me that the monomyth and Campbell was dealing with spe a specific type of antagonist, and a hero is a type of antagonist, whereas an antag a, a protagonist, rather, uh, a protagonist. Uh, uh, what What is your take on the difference between protagonists and uh, uh, heroes, Gabriel? It's, I think now, it's interesting now that now that like mental health, I think, is such a huge conversation right now. I mean, like millions, I can say millions of Americans like suffer from some kind of mental health. I think it's completely subverted that whole the whole um, hero and villain thing. I think I think we it's um, because of that conversation, we have to completely reevaluate, you know, antagonist versus protagonist. Like you someone brought up the Joker thing earlier. I, I still think. I still think that that's an important story. I'm glad that story was was told on such a broad level. Um, so yeah, I just think I there there's a there's a common term or not a term, but um, when you're when you're being sort of arrogant on social media now, you'll get backlash saying, "Man, you're acting like the main character right now." So that's sort of that's I think that's kind of a neat neat way to frame uh, a way that that hero's journey is actually like insidiously kind of seeping into, into our lives for, for um, you know, in, in kind of a negative way. Uh, Joel, picking up on that point, uh, do you see a difference between the protagonist and the hero? And since modernism, and even if you could go back to something like Tristram Shandy, uh, a novel like that, uh, that's, he's more of an antagonist. Why, why wouldn't modernism have killed off the idea of the hero? Why does it persist? And well, yeah, I, I, there are a couple layers here. I'm going to try not to do it too quickly and get too sort of professory on you. When I teach this, I say there are three basic definitions of hero in the ancient world, um, and then there's a modern one. In the ancient world, a hero is a member, of, or in ancient Greece, sorry, a member of a specific generation, the one before ours. Then the word itself means a young person in their full strength. That's the etymological relationship with the word hero. Right. Um, and then after that, it's uh, it, it has to do with this sort of pattern that we identify. So those three definitions are then different from the modern colloquial use, which is then combined with notions of self-sacrifice that are essentially Christian in their form. Right. Mm -hmm. There's no sense in pre-Christian myth that a hero will sacrifice themselves for their community. In fact, if anything, from the Greek tradition, they're all selfish bas bastards who destroy their communities. And again, that's the first seven lines of the Iliad. Achilles' rage sent all his own people to their doom. And in the Odyssey, Odysseus tried really hard to save his people, but he didn't. And then he got home and killed them all. Right. Um, so the, the, I, I think we have to separate, like if we're doing a diachronic study of myth, we have to separate the different layers and how they recombine and then really critique the reception in the 20th century, putting Campbell at the, set, at the center for not dividing these things. So the childish stuff we're talking about, the good versus evil motif, that's not there in antiquity. Right? There is no Greek myth that has a good versus evil. There might be antagonists and people banging against each other, but uh, something I always point out, like a signal difference between modern storytelling and heroic narrative and say the Iliad, um, is that there, there's no bad person in the Iliad except all of them, right? Everybody in the Iliad is bad to a certain extent. Achilles, you might say, oh, he's a protagonist, um, but he prays for his people to die, and his best friend or lover, Patroclus, dies as a result of that. Like, he kills Patroclus. Um, so I, I just think this, this is a feature of the oversimplification, right? And that, you know, you could say things like The Matrix or Star Wars or even Harry Potter. We have concretized death in a way, the devil, all of these things as the antagonist and it comes out in sort of the force and all these things. Um, but it's again, it's that, that layer, that Christian layer that, that has really changed what myth was. 
Um, when you talk about not being uh, any good or bad, uh, I think of like the so-called monsters or the, the, the others in Greek myths. Like if you think of Polyphemus or Scylla and Charybdis, they just are sort of forces of nature. I'm right? Polyphemus. Yeah. Right. And, and the signal difference, I, I, I'm definitely talking too much now, but the difference I always give is the difference between the creation story in Genesis and the creation story in Hesiod's Theogony. In Hesiod's Theogony, which is contemporaneous with Homer, um, everything is related to one twisted family tree, right? So the dominant, uh, cre the dominant paradigm for creation is biology. Whereas in uh, Genesis, God creates things and says they're good or not good, right? Deciding what's good or evil is there at the beginning. And so this is a very different way of looking at the world, right? Polyphemus is in a way Odysseus's distant cousin. Right. And he serves there to help people decide what's human and civilized. Um, but he's not evil in an intrinsic way. All right. Oh, you go ahead. Gina. Uh -huh. Oh, just to leap in really quickly, uh, because I primarily study uh, West European fairy tales as well as the transformation in contemporary literature. Uh, yeah, I think thanks in part to Disney, there's a major conception that fairy tales have always been about good versus evil, all those things. Uh, a good moral message for your kids. Um, fairy tales are quite amoral. If you go back to the roots of the genre in um, 15th, 16th, 17th century um, Italy and France, um, you know, Puss in Boots or Constantino and his cat, as it is in um, Straparola's version. This dude has a talking cat who swindles people out of all their stuff. Cool. Good, good life story there. Good life lesson. Um, you know, there's, there are so many, you know, these early tales that like there's no good or evil necessarily. Like the the uh, roles that the characters are in, the, the tale roles, according to prop, dictate whether they're the hero or the villain or the donor figure or magic helper. But applying sort of a monomyth lens to fairy tales misses out on a lot of the um, kind of weird ambiguity that these stories had in their original time periods. So I just wanted to say that. Um, I just, just before we pause here for a moment, uh, is that something, uh, Gina, that's uh, sort of uh, writ in the, the Italian myth? Telling because when I think of Boccaccio, even if I think of going to just the 19th century with uh, Pinocchio, um, a lot of Italian, what would be considered children's tales or, or, or moral tales, aren't really moral because Pin Pinocchio is not a particularly moral character. Forget that he, 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 he has the nose growing and, and the lying, but he goes through his adventures and a lot of odd things happen. I was just wondering, is that something peculiar to uh, Italian storytelling that uh, well, different, different than other Europeans? Um, no, I, I think that's common to a lot of early folktale traditions. Um, so you know, we define fairy tales as those folktales that are narrowly uh, magical, often quest focused, things like that. Um, folktales, more broadly speaking, they don't have to have magic in them. They often have ordinary protagonists. But a lot of early folktales are basically people like swindling and tricking each other. There's a lot of like tricking priests out of things. There's a lot of cuckoldry. Um, so I think just the general folks, the European folktale tradition, also Middle Eastern as well as in the Arabian Nights, is just pretty amoral. It is partly um, an outlet for uh, forbidden and taboo desires. It's a way to kind of snicker at the upper class because, oh, they're just, they're just fairy stories, whatever. Don't take them too seriously. So I think there's a lot going on under this veneer of, oh, it's just entertainment. They're just fireside stories. Um, yeah, there, there's a lot of that in Italy, but there's a lot of that everywhere from these um, earlier time periods. Well, uh, one of the articles in, when I went, went around looking for people to do this show that I came across was uh, an article by uh, someone named uh, uh, Charlie Jane Anders. And she listed basically, uh, she condensed down, I looked at a few dozen articles, some had 12, 15, 20 things against him. Well, she condensed them down fairly neatly to eight major bullet points. And I want to go through them one by one and get each of your opinions about them. And the first one that uh, she did, which is probably the least, uh, I guess, the least uh, aggrieving uh, of, of them, is that the monomyth is just another formula for telling a story. Um, so let me start with you, Valerie. Uh, what, what is your take on formulas in general and the idea that Campbell was just uh, iterating a formula? Formulas in general, you can do it well or you can do it badly. I have seen formula stories like, say, original Star Wars or Harry Potter that everybody loves to death. And I have seen, um, I thought, Star Trek Nemesis 
was hitting all the Joseph Campbell buttons very clearly because it's everybody fighting their evil sons and things like that. But I was just going, this is awkward and I'm not feeling it. And they definitely felt like they, you know, grabbed the tropes and were going to make this fit Joseph Campbell, whatever it took. So I'm not saying don't use formula, but yeah, we probably want some other reason that this is supposed to be appealing and fun for us. Uh, Gabriel, what is your take on the idea that it's a formula? Um, yeah, I agree with Valerie. There's nothing. There's nothing wrong with writing in a formula. I, I, and again, this is. I think the reason I hear is for very personal reasons. Like I, as you, the rest of you are very, are coming at this in very kind of more of an academic way. I, I personally gravitate towards. Okay, they say they say that one of the best parts of storytelling is to teach empathy, right? I think the way I learn empathy through storytelling isn't through the traditional structure. I love, like, I love stories where there's no likable characters. Like, some of my favorite stories are like ones like I think Joel was mentioning. Was it, was it the Iliad? Is that what you mentioned? Where where everyone's guilty. I, stories where everyone is guilty. I think are so important because it shows how, what a slippery slope it is, you know, that we all have essentially have evil inside of us. And I think, I think once you show can show a reader how easy you can slip into that, that's, that causes actual real um, introspection with the reader rather than, um, I guess, a more pandering hero's journey. Um, yeah. So that's, that's kind of what, how I feel about that. The whole, Formula thing. Joel, your take on formula? I mean, formulas are useful, but most interesting where they break down and people modify them and change them. Um, the danger, though, remains that when you have an audience primed just to hear one thing, um, that all they hear is a formula. So two examples that are recent that I, I, I like to bring up is the Wheel of Time series and Dune, um, both of which are narratives in which the authors self-consciously said, look, I'm using the heroic narrative, but I'm challenging it. Right. Yet when people read them, they walk away thinking, oh, Paul Atreides is great. Like, no, actually, he's a dictator. He's terrible. He's going to ruin the universe. Right. And the same way, um, the Wheel of Time, like the thought process of what's it really like to be a hero and how does it affect people around you? It's great. Uh, it's a very interesting thought. But when you take 14 books to lay out the story um, and you don't have an editor, um, it's it's really difficult for people to take it because they get hooked into the narrative they know right again maybe maybe a heroine isn't the right idea but it's more like high fructose corn syrup right you get addicted to it you go back for that thing for that thing and the complexity of it doesn't really it doesn't really work. um let me just ask you joe before i go to gina um since you're talking about formula uh, in that way i was just as you were talking i just thought of uh, the foundation trilogy the original three by uh uh what's his face um uh, <laughs> As a mouth. As a mouth. Thank you. Brain fart there. One of the things I think that works about that is it takes the formula of of the the annals, the, the historic narrative looking back from the past, and applies it into the future, but also does it in a fictive way. And and it looks at it looks at life the way I don't know if any of you are familiar with Michelangelo Antonioni, uh, the, the filmmaker. It, it looks at it from afar, like you're looking through a, a telescope, like these are these little creatures doing, who have little effect on history, but let's focus on them. And that's, to me, a, an example of a good uh, way to, to take formula and twist it on its end. Uh, do you have any comment on that, Joe? I mean, so I think to go where Gabriel was before, so I do, I talk academic all the time, but I got into this because of my love for narrative and storytelling. Um, and I walked in, I think the first Asimov book I read was Foundation and Earth because it was my local library. And then I read the rest afterwards. And um, Foundation doesn't follow the patterns, right? It breaks with them and it makes the civilization the story. Right. 
Um, and, and, you know, I think if Asimov were a slightly better writer and stylist, he would have been more successful. But now as an adult, when I go back and read it, I'm just like, this is just almost unreadable. Um, but really, like making a culture, the story and not the people is part of the powerful thing there. And it's part of like the, an aspect of science fiction and narrative um, that often gets left out when we're talking about monomyth. Like where, where does the work of Arthur Clarke like rendezvous with Rama sit if we're just thinking about the monomyth, right? It, it doesn't in a way. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think that, that that's part of, again, my frustration is that there are so many different stories um, that can be told. Um, when the monomyth comes in the room, it's the most flamboyant and attractive thing. Gina, what's uh, your take on on uh, the, the idea of uh, it being a formula and pro or con? Yeah, like everyone else said, formulas aren't inherently good or bad. They're useful sometimes. Um, but I do want to go back to the foundation thing because I could not get more than a book and a half into this series because there were only two women and only one of them spoke. And I'm just like, okay. So when a formula is seen as universal, but it actually excludes people, this goes back to um, Gabriel's empathy point. Oh, yeah, this is great. This is for everyone. Is it? Is it? So that's, again, why I kind of take issue with the monomyth and with the things like it, where it's like, oh, yeah, it's totally universal. It's like, okay. And, you know, granted, I, uh, part of the problem, I think, and this is uh, me being just really critical, not just as, as an academic, but as someone who also loves stories and loves reading and writing, um, I feel like a lot of historically marginalized people are expected to empathize with the, the norm, the, the mainstream monomyth hero's journey character, the white, cisgender, heterosexual, middle-class dude, and we're taught to empathize with them because they're in the bulk of the stories that are, like, funded and produced and things like that. But then, like, white men aren't taught to empathize with people like me or people of color or whatever. So it's like, when you get, like, unidirectional empathy, like, that's a problem. And I do think that does come back in part to monomyth and storytelling and, and how we structure our stories and things that are seen as, oh, it's abstract, it's universalized, it's generalizable, it's all good. Well, no, maybe it's not. Uh, then the second point that she makes is uh, th that the elevation of the monomyth, dis monomyth discouraged originality, that if you think that all stories follow a particular pattern, uh, you're encouraging people to basically, I mean, you can look at it in Hollywood today, the way Hollywood formulates superhero movies or even rom-coms or, or whatnot. They all follow. And if one gets elevated as, as you know, a hit for whatever reasons, you get, you know, a dozen uh, inferior wannabes. Uh, what's your take on that, Gina? Um, again, I think this kind of goes back to the question of whether formula is inherently good or bad. So lately, I've been reading a lot of romance novels. They're highly formulaic, but I think that the fact that they they play within the bounds of reader expectations and innovate within those bounds, that's what genre does. Genre sets expectations, no matter which genre it is, and then people either play in the sandbox nicely, in which case readers are like, yeah, or they like throw the sandbox into the void, in which case, in which case readers are like, Ugh. So I, again, like I, I don't think formulas are inherently good or bad. It's what you do with them. And so to this question of whether the monomyth has stifled innovation, um, yeah, in some ways I think may, maybe it has not only stifling innovation, but also stifling looking outside of Western action-oriented, masculine-oriented storytelling norms. I think that's a problem. Valerie, do you think it stifles? I'm agreeing with Gina. Um, lots of things stifle creativity. The movie theaters saying that, yeah, um, powerful white dude in the center role definitely sells and something else might or might not sell. So let's go with the safe option times a million. Superhero origin stories are stifling creativity because bad are those identical. Um, the three X structure is stifling creativity. I mean, the, the Hollywood concept of if we go the safe route, we'll make a lot of money and people want more Ghostbusters, more Star Wars, more of all the things we've been doing before, but we would never want to do anything risky and unusual. We just need to, yes, make a million copies of whatever is the hot thing this year. There's a lot of stuff stifling Hollywood creativity. But on the other hand, the um, the self-publishing that's been rising like crazy and the encouragement um, 
campaigns like We Need Diverse Voices among uh, children's books and so forth, we are seeing a lot more creativity and diversity. And can we get some non-Western stories? The science fiction community is actively recruiting from around the world. So I am seeing some really cool creative stuff happening, but from the bottom up, not Hollywood down. Well, it's not just Hollywood. Let's say there's Chekhov's gun too in theater. Um, but uh, Gabriel, what is your take on the idea that uh, the monomyth and the hero's journey uh, are stifling creativity and originality? Yeah, I completely agree. So I'm kind of, I, I kind of call myself a genre of refugee. So I, I, for years I was writing, and I still will write sci-fi and, and crime and noir and stuff, but the more I would, the more I would um, submerge myself in those communities, the more suffocating I felt because, and I think this has a lot to do with, like I, well, like I said before, I, I just was re, like my peers seemed like we're just writing the same story over and over again. Just with different characters, and what's happening now? Now that um, now they're all watching movies at home, you know what I mean? Like now that now that um, movies are like on demand, it's that it's broken open that whole industry. So now you can tell. I I just feel like I can tell so many authors that write genre fiction. It's like they don't just want to write a good piece of literature. They're actually trying to get a movie made out of their out of their book yeah. like that's that's the end goal now so so yeah you that's and as a result these novels are extremely formulaic because that's like the that's the hollywood blockbuster kind of scavenger hunt so yeah that's i've kind of i've felt like the way i like to write i've, I've had to kind of distance myself from the whole genre world for for better or worse well, i just, think my favorite but my favorite stories are the ones where the character—it's a completely immersive experience into into a character, and part of that, and not all characters need to change. Well, let me let me just ask you something, Gabriel. Um, since you yeah. uh, you just talked about uh, noir writing or uh, crime fiction, uh, are, you, are you a fan of film noir? Yeah. Uh, let me just ask you because uh, are you familiar? Let me just two films came to me out of the past with Robert Mitchum. Have you seen that one? And then uh, Nightmare Alley with Tyrone Power, because both of them seem to be uh, really terrific films outside of their genre because they are focused on what's wrong with those characters. Yeah, everyone's guilty too. Yeah. In those, yeah. I mean, I think that's what dry, what attracts me to noir is like everyone's everyone's guilty. It just shows that how how thin that that slippery slope is to to um, you know selfishness, I guess. Uh, Joe, what is your take on uh, the stifling of originality due to elevating a monomyth? We had a little problem. We got Joel back. So, uh, Joel, uh, I was just asking uh, for your comment then on the idea that uh, uh, raising the monomyth uh, uh, stifles originality, creativity, etc. So, I, I mean, I, I do want to go back to what Gina said earlier, which is that the formula allows, it creates, it's a genre thing, it creates a baseline within which great artists and performers can innovate and change and challenge it. It's just like language works, right? We're all hemmed in by the language share but great poets great artists uh bend and stretch the power of language um so i think the problem isn't so much the pattern um in the monomyth uh, but the problem is the monomyth sort of uh, toxic relationship with capitalism Right. Um, so it's not storytelling itself. It's the engine that drives the generation and incentivizes the generations of specific types of narratives. OK, so let me get to the third point. And this is what the first two points were sort of kind of generic points that she made. And uh, the third point, though, I think gets uh, to uh, something a bit more interesting. She says, why is one hero so special anyway? And she ends her little section saying, what about a hero who's the greatest because she decides not to put up with shit everyone else is putting up with? What about a group of people who decide to work together to change the status quo? I think of something like a film like Norma Ray, for example, from 40 years ago uh, about a union organizer or something like that. Um, let me start with uh, you, Valerie. Uh, what is your comment on that idea that she has about why is just a single hero uh, the focus? An awful lot of our stories 
have a central protagonist and um, because we empathize most with the central protagonist, whoever this is, and we're seeing through their eyes and, and through the Jungian lens, the other characters, like I was saying with Wizard of Oz earlier, are parts of their subconscious. And this is certainly not the only way to tell a story, but it is a popular way to tell a story. And we also see this with a lot of fairy tales and epics and so forth. Not all of them. I mean, we've been talking about the Iliad, which really is, let's look at both sides of the camp and pop around to lots of people and their problems. So there are different ways to tell a story, but I feel like in the movie industry, it is likely, again, not 100%, that we've got the central hero who's the actor we paid the most money to and so forth that appears really big on the cover. And there's the best friend, the Bob, and proud to proud we go. Yeah. Uh, Valor, let me just follow up before I go to the others. Um, so would you say that it's a, a reason uh, of empathy? And I think of the, the Joseph Stalin quote that one death is a tragedy, but a million deaths is a statistic. So it, do you think the re reason uh, that m we have single heroes elevated is because we can more easily graft our empathy onto one individual rather than a group. I'm sure that's in there, although I've read good epic stories where we go to 10 different people's heads and we care a lot about all 10 people or, you know, care about the five of them that are good guys or something. Um, this might also factor in the fact that one person wrote an awful lot of an awful lot of stories have a single author or creator who, again, might be thinking in the single person format. There's lots of exceptions to all this stuff, but I really do think of a lot of stories, yeah, have a protagonist. Joe, what is your comment on the idea about the single hero? And does it have something to do with what I said with that Stalin quote? It's empath empathy is more graftable to the one. I mean, I think it may have a little bit, but I, I'm going to I want to go back to something uh, Gabriel said earlier. Um, but also I want us to keep thinking, uh, as Gina in, indicates, about genre and context. Right. So part of what we're talking about is the perverse impact of the movie industry on our storytelling. And duration of narrative matters a lot because you can't connect and empathize with a lot of people in two hours. Right. But you can over time. So one of the big differences between storytelling in the ancient world and now is duration. You would hear stories from the Trojan War your entire life in different forms and different genres. You would see them visually. You'd see them on the stage. And then you'd go to monumental performance of the Iliad and the Odyssey. And it would be a very critical, different thing. And what the those end stage narratives do is they, they illustrate that individual heroes are insufficient, that you can't have one protagonist. Um, and uh, because you need more people. So Caledonian War Hunt, Seven Against Thieves, the Trojan War narrative. It's all about one person not being quite enough, right? Um, so when, when Gabriel was talking about, oh, a lot of people I know are writing to sell a tale, right? I'm thinking about, you know, you know that, that perverse feedback loop. We see these stories as successful, um, and so we're going to sell them. But even there, there's a problem. Um, so I was reading about, you know, um, uh, Bezos' idea about what a good story would be and how, how the next successful show would follow a certain pattern. But when I look at, like, what he laid out, like, it's wrong. The biggest, most successful shows don't follow the pattern. Like if you look at, say, uh, The Sopranos all the way or Breaking Bad and Game of Thrones, um, they're not following that specific pattern. If anything, Game of Thrones flirts at times with the monomyth, but it never does it. It does something very different. Um, so I, I think that the, the impact of that single protagonist is more felt in the short form narrative. In long form narratives, you have the space to open up to different figures and to empathize. And I think it's the duration of narrative experience that makes the difference. Well, let me just follow up uh, with it for a moment with you, Joe. Um, uh, the show that I did just before this one was on uh, a John Cassavetes film called The Killing of a Chinese Bookie, which I don't know if you're familiar with the work of Cassavetes. He focuses on character more so than even Ingmar Bergman. I mean, he will look at a character, follow it. The, the characters will wander around the screen and you'll, you'll, you'll see little details. It, it isn't 
dr drama filled. When you talk about Hollywood, are we talking uh, that maybe jump cuts, the, the way that the camera has to move every 2.3 seconds, otherwise people will get bored. Um, what, what, do, how does that figure into what you just said? Well, I'm thinking more so, so the, the classic blockbusters, the comic book movies, everything that we're talking about, you know, fast action, you establish just a little bit of character enough to go on um, so that the action and the spectacle is the thing, not the narrative itself. I think we can contrast with sort of a critical long form narrative, even like what's the, the Amazon show, The Boys, right? It, it's a send up of comic book mm. material. It's really body and weird, um, but establishes many different character arcs over time um, and a lot you know forces you to empathize with bad people and to follow people in different directions and I just think that you know to, to really think about the protagonist model and the monomyth um, uh, issue we have to look at the narrative ecosystem that's made it possible um, which is you know the 90 to 120 minute blockbuster. Gabriel what's your take upon uh, the, the single hero and uh, the focus on that? I was I was really yeah I was um, racking my brain while while the others were talking that you know, if just going through it seems like every every time that story is told there's still a leader in in it for people you know that that's being focused on but then but then I realized oh one of my favorite books of all time The Outsiders by S.E. Hinton that's that focuses on a group where I feel like there you know there's um there's eight any kind of, I mean, it's Pony Boy, but it's eight, eight of those characters that you're really focusing on. So I think it can definitely be done. That's, I, I mean, I think that's one of the greatest, greatest stories ever told. Um, before I go on to the next point, uh, picking, oh, I'm sorry, Gina, did, I didn't go to give you, sorry, go, go ahead, give you a point. Yeah, uh, just, just a couple of quick things come to mind. Um, first off is that the earliest, um, Folk tales and fairy tales weren't standalone stories. Like I know nowadays we think, oh, like, oh, buy the picture book of Cinderella for your niece or whatever. It's a standalone movie. But um, the earliest tales were actually embedded in frame tales. Um, and many of these early tale telling traditions would have, um, and I, I assigned my, my poor first year seminar students a chunk of Decameron to read because they're like, well, that's a plague narrative. We're living in plague times. Um, but some of these earliest tale collections. Um, had people, you know, fleeing the Black Plague or doing whatever, um, ending up in this sort of contained enclosure where they would take turns telling stories. So you already had an ensemble cast built into the frame tales that led to our earliest folk and fairy tales. So that's one point is that we've always had community. Um, second, to go to a point that Joel made, um, yeah, uh, context is everything. So many um, of these early folk narratives, myths, legends, and fairy tales would have been told as a part of oral tradition in pre-literate and non-literate societies. And there are robust debates about how people pulled off long form narratives in that time that we're not, probably not gonna get into right now. But yeah, you do find a singular focus on a singular uh, protagonist in many of these early folk narrative traditions due to the context, due to the tale telling context. So I do just wanna say there is some precedent in folk narrative that might have established the singular hero before literature really came along. Um, so that might be a factor here. But again, uh, these things are always happening in community as well. So to take the hero as the only thing to focus on is a little strange and reductive. Uh, before I go on to the next point uh, from that article, I just want to pick up on something that I think Joel uh, might have alluded to. And that's the idea that uh, could, could modern Hollywood, and we'll, we'll stick with that since that's overwhelmingly more influ influential than uh, the book publishing industry or, or uh, you know a lot of other things uh do you think that in some ways uh the way that some people have counted the monomyth has by, been by making everyone a psychopath everyone dark the, the darkness is somehow equated with complexity when when i watch a lot of these shows whether it's uh I don't have cable, but sometimes I, I do see some individual episodes people send me who recorded stuff. And, you know, it's like uh, Breaking Bad, uh, uh, Tony Soprano, um, all of these characters are sociopathic in some way. And we're supposed to empathize with them. Uh, and, and somehow that that gives them depth, whether we're talking about the joke or whether it's the Heath Ledger iteration or the more recent one uh, that, that was the standalone movie. Um, Joe, let me just ask you, do you think that in some ways the reaction to the monomyth has been to gone overboard into this darkness being 
being held up as some kind of a virtue? Well, I, I think I'd answer this one in a squirrely way and look at it from a from recombination of different traditions. You know, from you know, if we're looking at Walter White in Breaking Bad, I think he's essentially an Odysseus character, um, and you know, he, he goes home. He, he, he's really sort of self serving. He'll do anything to survive. Um, it's a contemplation of what happens when you go to extremes. Um, I don't think you would have seen that in ancient Greece because we didn't have the this is good and this is evil in the same way. Um, so I think the sort of our sort of anti-hero model um, is, is that it's a product of the recombination of sort of monomythic and ancient mythic patterns um, and so sort of Christianized good and evil stuff. Uh, uh, Valerie, uh, do you have a comment on what I just said about the, the overreaction to maybe darkness and sociopathy? I could certainly, absolutely, there's a trend toward being dark and edgy. In fact, I, I'm writing The Villain's Journey now because while there are stories that existed before, right now Hollywood is going bonkers with let's do the Joker movie, the Cruella movie, the Maleficent movie, uh, Wicked the Musical. You know, we're really taking a look at these villains. Um, for various reasons, and this absolutely might be a, could we get away from the hero, or could we go darker and edgier because that's provocative and people will respond to it, but as many have pointed out at some point, this just gets gratuitous and we're just watching them torture Handmaid's Tale characters for endless episodes of torture, and is this really making our day? Maybe not. Yeah, it's, uh, there's a website called TV Tropes, and I think a lot of people mistake an, what an anti-hero is versus what a likable bad guy is. An anti-hero is someone who's gray. You don't know if they're really bad. He's he, That person is on the fence. They, they could be bad. They could. But when you get someone like uh, a Walter White or a Tony Soprano, there really isn't any gray. They may be likable, but you don't want to, you know, you know what I'm saying? Uh, Gabriel, uh, what is your take on uh, that? The the darkness yeah, factor. I th I think it's really interesting. I think there's a real hunger for it right now. I think I think like politically, sort of like what happened after like the Reagan years. I think politically we're we're almost entering like a transgressive and artistically transgressive time. It's like we're we feel pissed off. Like we we feel this anger, and also I think we want to try to understand why why someone like donald trump could have become president like what the appeal is there you know now now that that's supposedly like in our rear view mirror um but yeah i think i think it's no wonder I, um like valerie was saying though yeah it's so it's almost it's crazy i mean you look at netflix now and it's like it's so much just like gratuitous true crime stuff that it's like repellent and i you know i like to think i have the stomach for that but it's like insane like it's like the murder channel <laughs> you know uh gino any comment about the the darkness substituting for depth say there's a real trend for dark fairy tales right now i mean it has been for a little over a decade maybe um and it's it's interesting i feel like it is almost kind of its own like uh self-contained thing where people are like but disney valorize the original tales and so we're gonna go back to the originals and look at how dark they are and remake them it's like okay but first off like don't say the original when referring to oral tradition unless you have a freaking time machine thank you very much um but it's just it's it's so trendy and i i do i, I mean i do think it actually is in fairy tale land at least an attempt to lend depth because many fairy tale characters are very depthless like they just they lack psychological depth, motivation, all the things, a lot of backstory. So I do see things like Maleficent as an attempt to revisit these characters who are kind of just like um, superficial characters and earlier renditions and like give them a backstory and give them history and all the things. So on the one hand, like I, that I get, but on the other hand, I just, I feel like it's become kind of trendy to be cynical and be like, I'm going to read the Grimm's tales because they're grim. And I'm like, oh, okay. Okay. Pat yourself on the head. Um, the next, uh, point that she makes is that the hero is always male, basically. And uh, I think we've covered that up to this point. Do, do any of you have any comment further than what's been said so far in the first almost hour and a half? No? Okay. So the, then the, the next point that 
uh, is made by uh, this uh, Charlie Jane Anders is that the monomyth is very cheesy and very cheesy in the sense that it uses sort of new age simplistic terminology and 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 things for example you know if you look at star wars you have the yoda there's always this kind of figure that spouts these sort of inane homilies or that 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 uh tries to galvanize uh, the the quester with uh basically what I guess even then you could look back and say is, is new agey or it, it doesn't deal with the material world so much as it does with the immaterial, but not in the sense that it's any way introspective. Um, let me just start with you then, Gina. What What is your take on that? Yeah, no, I, I just, I just kind of agree. <laughs> I don't have a lot to add to that. It's, um, Oh, it's a little annoying. And again, when you take um, myth out of myths out of their cultural context, you lose the spiritual and religious dimensions of the truths that believers would find in it. So I agree. Some of this stuff comes up, comes across as kind of an empty words and so on. Okay, uh, Gabe, your your idea? Yeah, I think so. What you're you're saying, you're talking about like someone like Yoda being like the the sort of pandering teacher well, yeah, type in, in her in her article she talks basically that uh it's well I'll, I'll, I'll quote it it's very brief she says uh here are some choice new agey quotes from campbell sample quote your sacred space is where you can find yourself again and again whoa dude i just felt my crystal vibrate a little campbell also appears to be the inventor of the phrase follow your bliss so that was <laughs> you know yeah i I, I agree. That I, I think that's yeah. Those those are all pretty repellent, repellent um, uh, terms. And I think yeah. I think I don't know. You use if you spend enough time with yourself, I, I feel like you'll you'll find you'll find everything you need to know. I, I don't think you know there needs to be any kind of teacher or like talisman that's going to teach you you know what your next step is going to be. I think that yeah, kind of instilling that into people kind of takes takes you further away from the path. Really, Valerie, a comment there? Do you have? I'm gonna go back to there's good storytelling and there's bad storytelling. I I hate self help books. Somebody recommended a self help rather hero's journey book, and I was just going. Um, Babylon Five did spiritual. And I want to say well-written, although if we took some of the one sentences by themselves, they might be equally cheesy and awkward and weak. It's absolutely hero's journey. It's spiritual, but non-denominational and or made-up religions. So I've seen it done well, including the guru who makes you think. And I've seen it done cheesy, overpopular. I want to see things go smash. It depends who's writing it. Hmm. Uh, let me just ask you because I, when that was on uh, in the '90s, uh, I the where I lived, I didn't get the station that had Babylon Five, so I did see though uh, Star Trek: Deep Space Nine, and I thought they really handled religious atrociously there. I think they they dumbed things down. Did, did what? What was your take on those two shows, just briefly, if you could? Uh, which one? I, I assume you think Babylon was better. Most people think Babylon was better. <laughs> okay. Tee -hee. Um, and there was a line in Babylon 5 about this isn't just some deep space franchise. This place means something <laughs> as they were having their fun. Um, deep Space Nine occasionally made interesting points about religion. I found Deep Space Nine very uneven, uh, not just because different contributors were doing different takes on the characters, but just what message they were trying to do and what the show was trying to be about seemed to vary greatly from season to season. So again, there are some episodes that I know people use to teach all kinds of things, and there are some moments that do stand out. But yeah, I go for Babylon 5, which of course has the big five-year epic arc, arguably is one of the stories that started off the five-year epic arc. Yeah. Um Joe, let me ask you about, well, I guess you could call it the Yoda factor that's in, in the whole idea of monomyth. <laughs> I mean, it, it often, so if we go back again to what I specialize in in Homer, um, 
epic and mythic narrative sort of functions as pan narrative. So to use a Star Trek metaphor, it's the Borg, right? And it takes everything and just represents it as it can. Um, so I, I think to an extent uh, you get sort of an example of the current sort of milk toast philosophy is going on and sort of testing them where possible. Um, so one of the things people say about the Iliad is in book nine, when Achilles is trying to figure out if he's going to go back to battle or not, he's experimenting with different ideas from different traditions about what it means to be a person, what it means to be a hero. Um, so rather than sort of judging the monomyth, I'm going to judge um, Lucas and Star Wars with sort of the, uh, the lack of intellectual depth um, to some of the ideas that are given, right? Um, and again, I'm going to go back to what, what's the context, right? You can't be too preachy, too complicated. Um, I think a contrast to Star Wars is The Matrix, um, where, you know, the first time I saw it, I was in college. I was like, well, there's Plato, there's Descartes. What else do we have going on here? Turns out there's a lot of Judith Butler going on. Um, so it's not that um, it's not that myth, monomyth can't be philosophically challenging and deep. Um, it's about anticipating what your audience is capable of and about the interests of the creator, too. So, Joel, uh, since you have uh, to go, let me just ask you, and then I'll fi finish up the last couple of points with the others. Um, what what it would be your overall take on uh, the uh, Campbell, the monomyth, uh, 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 pro and con, and uh, any points that have been made in this discussion so far that you'd like to elaborate before you go? Well, um, one thing that we haven't really talked about that I, I would like to mention um, is that, you know, we've learned a lot from structural anthropology and narrative about how the way we structure narratives uh, replicate parts of our own culture. Um, and so one of my biggest concerns about the monomyth is not just that it's patriarchal, but it's deeply heteronormative, right? Um, and it really, it, 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 it marginalizes any type of, of gendered or sexual identity um, that isn't part of, of sort of a patriarchal culture. Um, so that's one that really disturbs me and you see it in its worst elements in the way a lot of sci-fi narrative um, and fantasy narrative um, can really use sort of non-heteronormative behavior as an indication of evil, right? Or being suspicious. Um, and that's it's really bad in the Doom books. Um, again, to go to Wheel of Time, um, there's like, Wheel of Time is so biologically essentialist um, that, it, that it's sort of damaging. So I worry about the monomyth as perpetuating aspects of our culture that aren't um, questioned and aren't in step with what we need. Right. And even if you're saying, well, what if we make room for a person of color as a hero or a woman or a transgender person as a hero, um, you're still centering the self in a narcissistic way um, that 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 doesn't that looks to someone like, sorry, Elon Musk to save us. Right. Um, rather than thinking about the community and, and valuing that above and beyond all else. Um, so I would result, I would assign um, the monomyth to the dustbins of history. Let mythographers study it. Let narrative people study it. Um, but don't don't let it be a guidebook for Hollywood anymore sort of your starting cell moment in the class. Yeah, I think Elon Musk used to watch Flash Gordon too much. He reminds me of Ming the Merciless. But uh, um, I do want to thank you. I will link to your Brandeis University page along with the other people's pages. So uh, I'll, I'll let you go now. And thank you for participating. Thank you all. Bye. Bye. Okay, so uh, we just had it. The ladies are now on the right and, and uh, Gabriel slipped down to... Uh, the left side. So let me uh, get these final two. Uh, let me get back up again here. The final two points that were made by this uh, other writer, Charlie Jane Anders, uh, who, by the way, is a, a trans woman. So that's one of the reasons that I think she she brought up some of those points that uh, Joel just made in his final uh, uh, volley. So uh, the the seventh one, uh, she says. Let me just make sure this is number seven. Yeah, uh, is that. Campbell was guilty of shoehorning a lot of myths into uh, his idea, uh, it basically uh, putting a, a round peg into a, squ a square peg into a round hole. Uh, let me start with you, Valerie. Uh, do you find that to be a flaw that Campbell was guilty of? Sure. I mean, there are absolutely um, structures out there that are less conducive to or not trying to make those exact points. And 
For instance, when I first read Hero with a Thousand Faces, he said, um, the man goes down into death. Here's the story of Inanna. And I blinked a little and said, oh, that kind of seems to contradict your point that you made elsewhere, that the heroine is the damsel in the tower for the hero to rescue. And that's how the story goes. So even again, in his original blockbuster, there were some things, and that's not even getting into the big um, non-Western argument, which obviously features and other things like we've discussed the difference between myth and fairy tale and so forth, which is one reason that, again, I'm differentiating into smaller categories, but also I, as my English teachers help, I am doing some of that myself. It, it's easy with archetypes to just put everything in the wise old chattering mentor box or something. Uh, Gina, picking up on that, she also uh, said that not only did he shoehorn the myths that he did mention, uh, but he excluded a lot of other myths from Asia, the Americas, Indonesia, uh, Africa, etc. Uh, pick up on that, if you will. Yeah, that's definitely in line with my understanding. Um, there are just so many myths out there, and so many of them are so strange. Um, I don't know what Campbell would do, for example, with the vagina dentata. Like, where does that one fit in? Do, do tell, because, uh, yeah, it was just, there, there's a lot going on there. But, yeah, I, I want to kind of um, piggyback on something that Valerie said, too, about the, the shoehorning specifically. Like, as I recall, Campbell sort of saw as cognates of one another Jonah being swallowed by the whale and Little Red Riding Hood being swallowed by the wolf. And it's like the, the, the motif of swallowing, yes, but, like, these things are separated by, like, centuries and traditions and all the things so like why are we making them all out to be the same thing that's just it's it's useless well sure but there, and of course there was a sexual aspect to the one and not in to the jonah uh uh myth uh mythos if you will uh and you know you, that even goes further to what i mentioned with pinocchio then the dogfish reuses that but it's in a totally different context than jonah because well, anyway, uh, Gabriel, what uh, is your take about both the shoehorning and also the exclusion of uh, non, let's say, Western uh, mythos? Um, yeah, I totally agree. I think I think that's one of the first things that kind of bothered me about it. I think anytime something is such a such an umbrella uh, concept that cover that tries to cover that much ground, I, I think it sort of sets sets itself up for failure. Um, and then, what, I'm sorry, what was the second part? The, oh, excluding... Excluding, you know, uh, non-Western sources. Um, yeah, I, I agree with that, too. I think we, we've got, we've, uh, we've touched on that a lot. I wanted to actually... Um, Valerie brought up diversity earlier and how, how there's a tr more of a trend towards diversity to kind of get away from that. Um, the, one of the... I interviewed this one writer when I was doing my... My article for this, this guy, this guy, uh, Jaziel Vasquez from Argentina, and he brought up something really, I thought was really kind of profound moving forward. Um, I'm just going to read it right here. He says, so the, the hero's journey is basically about someone changing. Um, so I think it'd be, it's going to be really interesting how diversity um, tackles this, because he said um, expecting anyone to change is going against their autonomy. This is especially true for minorities. We are plagued with stories where minorities are winning, correcting their flaws, which in the end feels performative or at the very least reductive. I just thought that that was, that's, that was a really good, um, really nuanced point. Well, let me, let me pick up on that and, and, and head it over to the two women on the panel. Um, one, one of the things that I find kind of uh, Silly, and this goes beyond Campbell, uh, and especially it's in the Hollywood uh, television action genres, superhero genres, is this uh, modern trope of what we'd call babes in heels. So that instead of having women uh, have merits of, of their own based on their own sex or sexuality, you have women basically aping men, and that you have, say, a 120 pound woman in high heels. With, you know, without a bra, with her, her, her breast exposed, you know, kicking and beating men twice her size as if they're trying to be 
somehow masculine but yet feminine. And to me, I've always found it silly. If you're going to have, if you want to have a character that's really going to resonate, um, you know, uh, you should have it be based more in, in the reality of the situation. Yes, if you're going to have uh, gods and goddesses and, and superheroes, okay. But to me, when I think of that babes and heel trope, I just find that missing the, it, it, it's a wrong way to try to counter what is wrong with the monomythic ideas. Rally, what is your take on that uh, idea? You can write good, uh, well-written female characters, or you can write really, really clumsy, pandering uh, to, I would assume, straight men, uh, female characters. There are good writers and there are bad writers. Um, I have read amazing novels with female heroes who felt authentic and we cared about and we respected. And I have read, yeah, that's not really, that might be somebody's idea of a female character, but no, thank you. And um, shout out to of course, um, Hunger Games, which arguably launched this concept of you could have a heroine who doesn't have to be treated as a joke or made less powerful or called Buffy the Vampire Slayer and the joke is that her name is Buffy and she's a cheerleader and she nonetheless is powerful. You could have a woman who is fully dressed and powerful without the joke involved, and that led to many spin-off movies and just a different way Hollywood had of approaching this, although I can think of so many wonderful books that, of course, predated that with amazing women in fantasy. Juliet Marillier is one of my favorite authors for that, if you're looking for authentic female heroes. Uh, Gina, what is your take on... Uh the idea of babes and heels. I, I, I always have thought of it as sort of a, a, way, a, a way people want to counter that Campbellian idea, but it's done for me poorly. What is your take on that? Yeah, it's it's a sort of bizarre rehashing of second wave feminism. I actually, I have too many thoughts, but I also have to go soon. Oh. So um, yeah, I just, I have, I have a million thoughts. I think that again, it's just, it's a sort of like superficial, like she put her in a suit with shoulder pads, like in the eighties, like, yeah, girl power. So I, I think a lot of the modern day, like girl boss things are, they're just like, it's, it's like just putting a bandaid on something. And I'm just not super convinced that it's great. Again, like there, there can be compelling and interesting ways of doing it. I just don't see a lot of them. Okay. Well, let's uh, get to the last point and then we'll, uh, we'll give, I'll give each of you a way to close on here. The final point that Anders makes is that the monolith confuses personal growth with solving problems. Sometimes in order to defeat evil, you have to learn an important lesson and grow as a person, but often you don't. Oftentimes defeating a great evil just requires fighting like hell and doing what has to be done. And there's no time to meet the goddess or touch your magic wand or any of that stuff. Campbell's monolith is unrealistic and spreads the idea that war is therapy. So uh, Gabriel, let me just ask your final uh, thoughts on that and then final thoughts on the monolith as we close up. Um, yeah, I don't, I just don't think, I don't think a character has to change or that there needs to be conflict in order for it to be a compelling story. I, um, my, my favorite book that came out last year, one of my favorite books, Blacktop Wasteland by S.A. Cosby, the, the last, the last line, the last two lines of the book is, uh, this guy Bug, his wife asked him, are you ever going to change? Or he's, she's all, you're never going to change, are you? And he says, I don't know if I can. And that was the end of the book. And I just thought that that was brilliant, brilliant um, glimpse into humanity right there. And uh, what is your final uh, thoughts on what we've been talking about? Just to wrap up your, your thoughts, your final thought. Um, final thoughts would just be, yeah, I think, I think the hero's journey is a, can be a great a great formula it's been proved to be but i think i think we're we have an unhealthy addiction to it that's that's actually maybe perpetuated a lot of uh a lot of a lot of actual negative for all it's for all the positivity that it claims i think it's it's had just as much negative uh negativity in, into into our culture for sure and in, in just that the whole everyone is the main character uh, frame of mind. I think that 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 can be a, a toxic thing. I think people 
go through their day thinking that they're the main character and that they're owed something and that they're owed a big victory at the end. And that's just simply not how life works. Not Life is not a story. Well, I will link to your Lit Reactor page. Uh, Valerie, what is your final comments on both the monomyth and also the final point that And has made about the confusion of personal growth with solving problems? It is one of the reasons we find Hero's Journey and Fairy Tales and all this so satisfying is it does wrap things up in a packed fashion. And on page one, there there's pretty much a bargain with the reader that the hero is going to win. The hero does not always win, and it depends who's telling what kind of story here. But we come in with the expectation that Harry Potter is going to win the story or whatever. And it's, it's satisfying and comforting for readers, but yes, arguably unrealistic as a life lesson. And my final thought is creators out there Tell the story you want to tell. If you want to take bits of the hero's journey and throw out the bits you don't like, go for it. If you want to write an anti, anti hero's journey where you don't believe in the hero's journey and this is about some other message, some other goal, go for it. Whatever story you want to tell, don't be constrained by which rules somebody said are rules out there. Well, because good. you might create something really awesome. Uh, good advice. And ValerieFrankel.com is your website. I'll link to that as well. And let me close up with Gina uh, Jorgensen. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. What's that? VEFrankel.com. ValerieFrankel.com is somebody else. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> VEFrankel.com. Thank you for correcting me. Um, uh, and Gina, uh, if you could give a final comment on uh, the, the final point that I made about uh, from Andrew's essay, as well as your final thoughts on the monomyth. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the relationship between individual and society is really interesting, and there are lots of ways to conceptualize that in narrative. So I think if there are a way to rehabilitate the hero's journey with a more like social justice, like serving your community kind of way, like that might be interesting. Um, but yeah, my, my final thoughts are basically, you know, if, if Joseph Campbell is your gateway drug to reading other stuff, Cool. I, I can't really follow you for that. I do have friends who got into folklore studies that way. Um, but I would just always kind of caution readers to um, ask more questions like who's not in the room, who's not being represented right now, things like that. Like always question universals, because if someone's telling you something is universal, they probably want to sell you something, whether it's like actual commercial goods or a worldview or ideology or something like that. So just like question stuff is sort of my, my big takeaway. Well, I want to thank you both. And Gina Jorgensen uh, I will link to your site as well. Sorry about that, Valley. I, I just assumed it was ValerieFrankel.com. Uh, but uh, it was a great discussion, and thank you all.